Grab your swords for a moment. Well, a little bit more in a moment, okay? Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Thank you, my Lord. And the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to go buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now these were believers, as we've talked about before, because virgin means washed by the blood, and they are believers now. And it says that some of them missed the door, or that the door was open to them once already. Are you hearing? That the door was open to them once already, but they began to backslide. And not stay filled with the oil so that they could see. And when the bridegroom came, they weren't filled with the oil so they could not see. And they needed to go get some oil so they could see because there to be the light and stay filled. And when they went to go out and buy because they were entangled in the affairs of the world, the door was shut to them just like the door was shut on Noah's ark to the world. And he said, I don't know you. The door that was shut. I'm going to share a couple of things tonight that uh, may sound a little strange, but praise God. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, because I believe that the door is going to shut shortly. And I want to share with you about the door I'm, and a couple of visions that the Lord has given me pertaining to the door and the universe and so forth. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, is everybody there? In verse 14. Would you read it with me? It says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. Now, in the house of God. I want you to share with you that the house of God is the tabernacle. Does everybody get it? Everybody say the house of God is known as the tabernacle. We call it a sanctuary. We call it a temple, but it's representation of the tabernacle. Is everybody with me? He says, you know, but I, if I'm, I want to write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God or in the tabernacle, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world and received up to glory. He's talking about your conduct in the house of God or in the tabernacle. In other words, God was manifested by the spirit in the natural. The word became flesh, right? He was seen from the eternal realm, witnessed by angels. And he declared that he was the way to the eternal realm because he was preaching the gospel or the truth. The natural realm accepted him and he finished his call and returned to glory. Again, the house of God is a place of fellowship, teaching, and his presence. We call this his tabernacle, the sanctuary, the temple. In Psalm 15, tonight's teaching is called the entrance port of eternity. The entrance port of eternity. There is a port that allows you to enter the eternal realm, and it is called the tabernacle. In Psalm 15, one through five, would you read it with me? Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Or who may have access or maintain the area of the eternal port? Who may dwell in your holy, holy hill? He who walks, what? Uprightly and works righteousness. 
and speaks the truth in his heart. So he's telling us now how to conduct ourselves and maintain in this tabernacle. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, and whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be what? Moved from his presence. He shall never be moved from what? His presence. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Where is that place? That is in the tabernacle. In Exodus 25. So we see here that Psalm 15 was a guideline of maintaining in the tabernacle. In Exodus 25. In verse 1. Entrance port of eternity. Oh, we got to get this. See, we spend so much time looking in the carnality realm that we lose sight, and God really wants to bring us beyond the veil. In verse 1, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly. With his heart you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple and scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins and acacia wood, oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle. And the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So we see here, this is the tabernacle, the sanctuary, the temple. The, the, the purpose of God is to dwell with his people. He asked them to all bring an offering so that they could build a tabernacle. Everything was so that they could put it to purpose and build in a tabernacle. So we call it again a sanctuary, tabernacle, temple. We call it churches now. But there is an eternal tabernacle. And in Exodus, you don't have to go there. Chapters 36 to 38, you can read all about it. About all the furnishings and everything that's in it. But I'm not going to get into that tonight. I want to go beyond that. And Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Entrance port of eternity. Oh, glory. Can you imagine all those people when it started raining out? <laughs> When they never saw rain during Noah's time. And they saw this huge boat, which they didn't even know what a boat was. This huge ark mocked him, called him an idiot, all kinds of stuff. Why they did all fleshly things and fulfilled their desires. And God said something very powerful. He said, my spirit will not strive with man much longer. So Noah and his family get in the boat. And the ark, and all of a sudden it starts raining, and everybody's out there going, man, wait a minute. Maybe there was something about what he had to say. Hey, we need to talk to you. And boom, the door shuts. Wait a minute, we're not done talking to you yet. We need to find out what's going on. Too late, and they all died. We have a merciful God. We have a just God. In Genesis chapter 2, and verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. The breath of what? Life. And man became a living being. So I want you to understand it was the spirit that brought life to the body. In verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Why did he put the man in a garden? That was the first tabernacle for man. The garden of Eden was a place where man could actually dwell with God. Are you hearing so God set up a place for man that he created because man was sinless. The spirit is what gave life to him. He was an eternal being where God walked and talked right with him in this realm. But man fell. <laughs> yeah, let's go to chapter 3 and verse 7. In verse 7, read it with me. And it says that man fell and then the eyes of both of them were opened 
and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So man tried to cover himself. I, uh, I understand him. In other words, self tried to cover self. <laughs> it wasn't going to work. In verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord, what? Walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So at one time, they were, here they are talking to God face to face. It says that the Lord was walking in the garden. Now they couldn't see him. They can only hear him walking because they became blind. Everything was shut to them now because they had fallen. He sold on their own fig leaves, self, tried to cover self, and they began to run from the presence of God instead of to the presence of God. And the Lord had to do something about this. In verse 21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So before the Lord removed Adam and Eve from the tabernacle, because they did not abide according or conduct themselves according to what he said that was going to abide them in the tabernacle, in his presence, in a place of fellowship with him. And because of that, he had to remove them. And as he removed them, he took their fig leaves off and he killed an animal. And he, that blood now had to be life. No longer was it the spirit that gave life in the flesh. It was the blood that gave life in the flesh. Are you hearing? So their whole structure changed. And so the Lord said, he killed an animal. He said, you're out of here. I'll be here but you won't dwell with me ever again like you used to dwell with me until a pure blood comes that will open the door. And um, Leviticus chapter 17, so he took a life for a life. He killed, because now Adam and Eve would die. But the only way that he could restore his promises to them would be multiply and prosper, but they could not. They lost eternal life, so they lost life. But he restored his covenant with them to multiply and prosper by the blood of an animal he killed and covered them because everything is associated with covenant in life. So he took a life and he exchanged it for their life so that they could restore covenant. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. Would you read it with me? It says what? For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So we see now that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, there's something else that's important because we know that the, um, in the natural realm, in the blood, right, the blood is a carrier of oxygen, isn't it? And we need oxygen to live which we call air, or without air, we can't live, can we? Just like a fish cannot live in, its in, in our environment, can it? It's a whole other realm. And we can't live in their environment, environment without oxygen or air tanks. But the oxygen is in your blood now. It's not, so when you breathe, when you breathe, the air here goes in to your lungs and it has to transfer everything over uh, these capillaries, and it puts oxygen into your blood, which sustains your life. So when sickness comes and disease comes, the blood is contaminated. Why, that's why they take a blood test. They don't take a breathing test. They take a blood test to find out where you be. <laughs> so remember that when they left the tabernacle of the Garden of Eden, they left with blood. That's why the only way you can return into the tabernacle is with blood. Go to John 14. 
And Jesus said to him in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, yes, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to the Lord, we don't know where you're going, man. And, and how do we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. So he was talking twofold here. Not, was he going, not, not only was he going to prepare a way for them, okay, because he was the living tabernacle now, because he was going to die for them and prepare a way. He was going to open a door for eternity for them. But he, once he ascended into heaven, he was also going to prepare a place for them. Are you hearing? Are you listening? Good. So we know that the way, truth, and life are the name of the three chambers. The way, the outer court, the truth, the inner court or holy place, and the life, the most holy place. So when Jesus said, I am the way, truth, and life, he was saying, I am the tabernacle. I am the eternal door. I am the only way. I am the port, the entrance port to eternity. And nobody can get there without going through me. Go to John 2. In verse 18 it says, So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to him, Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it again or I'll raise it up. And the Jews said to him, Wait a minute, it's taken us 46 years to build this place. And you're going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body because he was the tabernacle. He was the entrance port to eternity. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoke. Destroy this temple, raise it up in three days. In other words, he was reestablishing the entrance for all mankind to the eternal realm. Why? Because it was closed in the Garden of Eden. And now he was going to reestablish and re-enter, reopen this realm by his death. Does everybody get it? Not only reopen this realm, uh, he was going to be the door. He was going to reopen by his death, and of course, in his resurrection. Now he says, in three days I will raise this up. In other words, I want you to grab this. What he was saying, for 3,000 years, this door will stay open. This door will stay open for 3,000 years. And at the end of 3,000 years, it will be shut, and no man will ever be able to enter this realm again. So for 3,000 years, one day with the Lord is equal to what? A 1,000 years. He told him, in three days, I will raise up this temple. What was he going to do? He was going to make a tabernacle and entrance to the eternal realm and that door was going to stay open for 3,000 years remember the door was shut at the garden when the Lord put a flaming sword with a cherubim there and he sent them out through the blood and Jesus was going to now be the way truth and life the living tabernacle he said I am the tabernacle I am the eternal door I'm going to make a way that's why when he died on the cross what ripped in the temple the veil the veil ripped in the temple. Why? Because he reopened the entranceway, the port to the eternal realm for all mankind. And it stayed open, and it's been open, and it'll stay open for 3,000 years. Go to Psalm 11. Psalm 11, verse 4 through 7. You know, as the Spirit began to bring me through this, I began to, he began to share with me the difference in the, the understanding of heaven we know is spiritual arena, but also heaven is associated with universe. And then there's a heaven of this realm, and then there's a heaven of another realm. I've been going, whoa, this is intense. <laughs> in verse 4, would you read it with me? And the Lord is in his what? Holy temple. The Lord's throne is where? So, wait a minute now. The Lord is in his holy temple, but the Lord's throne is where? In heaven heaven in the universe does everybody get it his eyes behold and his eyelids do what test the sons of men the lord tests the righteous 
but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. The Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. Now I want to explain this to you the way I was explained. The Lord is in the holy temple, okay, representation of this universe. And the throne is in the eternal, not the universe. The throne is where? In the eternal. It's not a part of this universe. His holy temple is a part of this universe, but his throne is in the eternal. Is everybody with me? Okay. Where is his throne? In the eternal. All right. I'm not talking about the heavenly and these that we call here in, in the universe. I'm talking about the eternal. His throne is in the eternal. His holy temple is in this universe. And it says that he tests the son's of men, doesn't he? In other words, what he was doing here, he was displaying his purpose of the universe was to train and test men before he would allow them to enter and share his eternal with them. Are you listening? See, it started right in the garden, didn't it? Didn't he, wasn't he training Adam and Eve? To what? Before he was going to allow man to enter into the eternal, he wanted to train them and test them, then he would share his eternal with them. So that's why he says his holy temple is in the universe arena, but his throne is in the eternal. So he was going to train man and test him before he would share his eternal with them. Go to Genesis 1.1. Training for reigning. So right in Genesis 1.1 it says what? In the beginning God created the what? Heavens and the earth. In other words, God took out of the eternal realm which is unmeasurable and he took out of the eternal realm and said time space matter out of the eternal realm he took something that he was going to set a training ground known as the universe so that he could train his creation and test them to enter the eternal so what he did is he just took a chunk out of eternal <laughs> And created the universe, which in Genesis 1, 1 says in the beginning, which means time. So he created time. See, because the eternal has no time. The eternal is a total different realm than you and I can even comprehend. In fact, if you kind of consider this, you know, we're in this realm. Everybody knows people, this, that. We have remembrances and whatever. What if you entered this whole other realm and you can't remember anything of where you came from? but everything was made brand new to you. Everything that you've just gone through and all everything of your whole life and everything that's going on here, when you enter eternal, what if it was just all wiped away and there was no husband, wife, and the little ones? No more demonic for No nothing. You were just one with the creator and his purpose to continue on in the eternal See, we can't comprehend that. <laughs> Go to Psalm 19. <laughs> Glory. You know, we get so caught up and so goofy here. You know, as I'm, I'm seeing more and more things in the natural around, you know, especially with, uh, what's going on in the economy and all of this other stuff, it's just like, yeah. It's like, man, you know what? I don't care who goes in president, it ain't going to change. Everything's coming down. <laughs> ain't nothing going to change. <laughs> I don't care who goes in there unless Jesus gets in there, then it's going to go up. But other than that, ain't, ain't, ain't nothing going to change. Things are still going to get worse. There'll, there'll, there'll be a, maybe a, a, a glimpse of, oh, things are getting better. No, they won't. They'll have that form of betterness, <laughs> but they'll deny the truth. The God of this age has blinded man in a tremendous way. Tremendously. I mean, it's getting worse. You know, people have to be careful now because they're even looking at riots. And I mean, this is global stuff now. Remember, the God of this world is money. So the first thing that's going to draw man out of another area or out of position is is money. They'll be willing to do whatever it takes to survive. 
because the world is in survival. And this is one of the ways the Antichrist has already entered because he's already here. So the economic has to be touched. It has to be changed. Now look at all, uh, look at the area right now where prices of gas have gone down tremendously. In one place, uh, they showed today it was a buck ninety nine a gallon. It was in some other states. So don't bother driving there. <laughs> I don't know what state it was in. I don't know, I don't know if it was Georgia or whatever, but it was a dollar ninety nine in one in another state. See, but the whole ploy was to yeah, I, I want you to just step back because all of the gas and all the oil, all the stuff was to suck the money as much as they could. Then everything else, the collapse of the everything has just been predestined and set up to collapse the economic structure. So things have to be restructured and hope that somebody comes in with some brains. See, everything is being established. We know that the Islamic terrorism has increased tremendously. They're globally. And we've talked about that. I mean, everything. Remember, 666 is going to be economic, religion, and government. That's what he's going to control. The economic, the religion, and government will all be 666. That's what it's about. See, so you can already see the two already are beginning to happen. And the government's already sold out. But this country is so blinded, and eventually they will wake up, but it's going to be too late. So we must constantly keep leading people to the entrance port to eternity. In Psalm 19 and verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. What's he talking about? Tabernacle. Watch. But he's looking at the universe as his tabernacle. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a what? Tabernacle for the sun. Where did he set the tabernacle? Where? In the universe. Now, I'm not talking about the tabernacle that you and I are accustomed to, that we've been talking about. I'm talking now about a universe tabernacle where God is using the universe as a tabernacle. Let's keep going. In verse 5, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, or one end of what? The universe. And its circuits to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat or his presence. So the tabernacle in the universe, the sun representing the true son of God, the bridegroom, coming out of his chamber, meaning a dimensional realm called the eternal, he becomes flesh, and his presence no one can escape from. One end of the universe to the other. Doesn't matter where you go, you cannot escape his presence. Go to Acts 17. Acts chapter 17. I'm going to explain a little of this here in a second. Acts 17 and verse 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we what? Live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offsprings. Does everybody see this? Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by the art of man's devising. So we look at this and we see that we live and breathe and have our being in him, in the universe. Why? Because the universe is in him. The universe itself is a tabernacle of God. Go to John 1. John chapter 1. In verse 1, would you read it with me? 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were what? 
made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and darkness did not what? Comprehend. So we see all things were made in him and through him. So was the universe made in him and through him. So I want you to look at something powerful because we, we think as God is just as person that became flesh and walked on the earth no god is much bigger in him is the universe come on everybody say in him is the universe see our peanut brain has a hard time comprehending that you can't what well, how did i get in? don't don't calculate it it's calculation of eternal these are eternals you can't figure out eternals. Your little, our, our brain would fry. <laughs> oh, did you ever see that commercial? The people using drugs, you know, they use the eggs. and This is your brain. <laughs> use drugs and you'll have two eggs over easy. <laughs> so all things are made in him and through him. So the universe is actually in God. That's why we can never escape. And his presence is what holds everything together. So we got it? Go to Matthew 7. <laughs> Glory. Matthew chapter 7. Is everybody there? Matthew 7 and verse 7. Would you read it with me? What did Jesus say? He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock and the door will be open to you. Those are the three chambers of the tabernacle. Does everybody see it? Ask. What are you asking for? Forgiveness. And it will be given. Seek what? Seeking the what? Truth. And you will find it. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds into him who knocks it. It will be opened. Does everybody see that? Now go to verse 13. What does it say? Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. He's talking about the tabernacle. Why? Because he is the tabernacle. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me, me but the way is narrow it's difficult isn't it why because there are certain things that maintain that help us to maintain in the tabernacle go to john 10 john chapter 10 in verse 7 john chapter 10 and verse 7 now um before we do this verse i want to share something with you as um I was praying, and the Lord began to speak to me about all kinds of things, and I all of a sudden I saw this. It almost looked like a uh, gold cylinder, almost like a gold cylinder floating, and there was darkness all around it, and, and it was almost like not only was there darkness all around it, but then I kind of like saw, I don't know, like universal things, certain Milky Ways or what I don't know, but I just saw, I saw this thing floating, and, and the Lord said, that's my entrance port to eternal to the eternal i can think of one then he began to show me about three chambers in this like huge cylinder that and and it's like and, and he share he was sharing with me because see the outer court is where the sacrifice is and then the, then the holy place is where the um the requirements are and then there's the most holy place where the ark of the covenant is and and you can only get in one way but it it it, it, it was like all, all the, this thing that was floating, and, and as he began to bring me through the, um, the chambers, out of the final last chamber was pure glory light, and that's all I, that's all I could see. But in other words, it took, as, as I would go through, go through this, it, was, it took me out of the whole universe. It took me into a, in other words, but this thing was still floating, but you couldn't see the other end of it. You couldn't see anybody coming through the other end unless you went through it then you would see the other end and go into e the eternal and other than that everything else was still just on this side so it's just like this thing that was just floating 
And in this, he said, this is my entrance port to the eternal. I thought, wow. And then he began to share with me, that's why he sent Jesus, because he is the door, the entrance port to the eternal. And again, you couldn't see anybody coming out the other end because it was not attached to this realm, to this, it was an eternal. When you, got, when you went through the most holy place and out that end, you were in the eternal. It wasn't anything a part of this, even though this thing was just floating around. <laughs> Does everybody understand what I'm, what I'm sharing? You didn't see anybody come out of the, the other end. They just, they were gone in the eternal. Is everybody okay? Good. I don't want you to think I'm nuts. Hey, you know, that this is where it's so important where you keep your imagination window clean with the blood so see god will speak to you to you envision through your imagination the window and as long as you keep that clean you can see and god wants to show you the essence of visualization is important remember we talked about um making the unseen seen and that's what god wants us to do but we must keep our imagination. We must keep our spirit, soul, body, and flesh, and our imagination and our emotions washed by the blood every single day. Why? So that we can be clean to vessels, set apart, away from this realm, so that the spirit can open areas so he can show us. And, and I was just sitting there and, and just praying, and all of a sudden I just stopped praying, and, and he just started speaking. But he began to speak to me, through visualization and he began to show me these things and i went whoa and 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 the area of this was the door won't be open much longer in other words get as many people to the door in verse um seven would you read it with me and jesus said to them most assuredly i say to you that what i am the door of the sheep I want you to see this as a whole other realm now, not just some tabernacle made in the carnal realm in this universe. This has nothing to do with this universe now. He, God Almighty, became the door for me and you. The entrance port to eternity. Oh, glory. All who entered came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. I am the tabernacle. I am the entrance port to eternity. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in. Hello? He's going to go what? In and out and find what? Pasture eternal. He's going to go in and go out the other end and find pasture. Has everybody got it? Oh, hallelujah. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. In other words, to prevent you from going through not only that door, but dwelling there and making it through the other end. See, because many people have gone in and then come back out. Many people have gone in and then come right back out, right into outer darkness. He said that I, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Well, where are you going to get more abundant life? In the eternal. But you can have a more abundant life right here by associating with the eternal. Listen, you don't need to pray in tongues when you get home. You don't need nothing there. <laughs> you don't need nothing there, man. You don't need to cast out no devils. You don't need to pray to the Holy Ghost. You don't need to do nothing. There's a total different realm that we can't even comprehend. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. In other words, he is the entrance port to the eternal. Again, this door is available for 3,000 years, then closes. First Peter chapter 3. Is everybody okay? First Pete chapter 3. You know, I just, I just really believe that the Lord wants to expand our vision. And really stop looking at everything over here. Remember, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, that we're no longer to acknowledge Jesus in the flesh. Who? Why? Because he wants us to stop looking at things according to the carnal flesh and associated with this universe. He wants us to begin to look beyond that and the other realm. Remember, we don't belong here, do we? 
In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, would you read it with me? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Through what? The tabernacle, the door. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and he preached to the spirits where? In prison, in hell. Who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. So where did he go preach? Hell. Do you remember when he went to hell? Well, when he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave and gave Satan a Holy Ghost kick, he walked over to where paradise was, opened the door. He walked over to hell. And he went, he didn't have to preach to those in paradise. Are you hearing me? He went and preached to those who were lost. Why? Because the door had opened to everybody, even in hell. I truly believe that. And he went and preached to those who were in hell and told them that he was the way. And if they wanted out of here, they could. And I really believe some rejected him because they wouldn't believe. See, Satan had promised so much to others that they were prospering according to his way. That they wouldn't accept Christ. Many rejected Christ. Who are still there right now. Why? Because they had a position in Satan's kingdom. Are you listening? Glory to God. What would he need to go preach to the, anybody else down there for? He didn't need to preach to anybody else. Everybody was rescued by righteousness. Right? Abraham was counted righteousness. Abraham, uh, they were all in paradise, weren't they? He said to the man on the cross, uh, the thief, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So he didn't need to preach to him. Or anybody else in paradise. When Jesus rose, he put his blood on the covenant that was already in heaven. And the door opened for all those who were in paradise to go. And he preached to those who were in hell that were willing to accept the eternal port. The entrance port for the eternal realm. Okay. Let's go a little further. Verse 21. There is also an anti-type which now saves us, baptism, not by the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So he went to hell and he opened the door to heaven of this realm, gave opportunity to the spirits in prison of hell to repent and come through the door, which was open to them. So everybody got it. Now, again, I want to share with you that there is a correlation between the tabernacle and the feast of the Lord also. There are three chambers in the tabernacle, isn't there? And I share with you about the vision that I had. And, and in this three chambers in the tabernacle, you got the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place, right? Would you go to Matthew 22 first? Matthew 22. Before we go any further. Matthew 22. In verse 11. It says, but when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into what? Outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but what? Few are chosen. See, the invitation is given. The word called means invited into the tabernacle. But many took the invitation, but never showed up. <laughs> and some came without an invitation. This man did. His garments were what? Not correct. And where was he thrown? Outer darkness. Around, like I said, around that whole cylinder of the tabernacle was outer darkness. Now, I'm going to share this with you so that you can write some of this down. Are you ready? Okay, the outer court. The outer court is associated with Repentance, mercy, blood. Remember, that's where the sacrifice is, right? So that's an area where you enter the first chamber through repentance. You're crying out for mercy, aren't you? And the blood of Christ is what's allowing you in the chamber. It's also a representation of convert. It's where somebody gets converted. And it's also associated with the first feast of the seven feasts of the Lord called Passover. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, which means the outer court. When he said way, truth, and life, those were the three doors. The holy place or the second chamber 
is called the truth. The first chamber is called the way or the outer court. The second one is known as the truth. Jesus was the truth. It's called the holy place. In this place is praise and worship. Say praise and worship. In this place also there is furnishings. This is where the Lord teaches us how to maintain. On the one side of, the, uh, of this room is the bread in representation that he is not only provider, but he is the bread of life. And man cannot live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So in the one side, it's a representation of his word. And then across from that is the seven lampstand, is the seven candles, a representation of the seven attributes of the spirit of God. And that's in Isaiah 11, where it's the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and so forth. So everybody get it? Isaiah 11, verse 2. That's called the menorah with seven lampstands. So this is what's lighting it. So what it's saying is we need to have the word. We need to have the spirit. This is where praise and worship is. This is where people get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Actually, it's the first place now where it's called, it's the priesthood anointing. Then there's another altar there like table of incense. And it is right before the door of the most holy place. And that incense represents the prayers of the saints. So what he's saying, this is what you got to do. You got to be filled with the word. You got to be filled with the spirit. And you got to be a prayer, an intercessor to make it. See, now only God can open the next door. Only he can open it. You can kick, scream and do whatever. And do all your emotional, whatever. He, that door will not open. Only when he sees your fulfillment and where your heart is at, he will open the door to you. He's the one that opens the door, not us. That's why it says, knock, and the door will be opened. First it says, ask, seek, then knock, and the door will be opened to you. Is everybody okay? So we see here now that in this, the prayers, intercession. So when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're filled with the Word, you're praying in tongues, aren't you? See, that is the prayers of the saints, which goes up as a sweet incense to the Lord. So everybody got it? Okay, so that is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the first chamber represents the Passover. The second chamber represents the unleavened bread. The word leaven means evil, and this is where Jesus descended into hell. So these feasts are being fulfilled. The next feast is called, well, the next chamber, first of all, is called the Most Holy Place. And this is where there is now pure worship. No more praise and worship. Pure worship. Pure. This is where the Ark of the Covenant is. And in the Ark is manna, which God sent, which means revelation. The Ten Commandments on the tablets are in the Ark, which means his law or his word. And then there's the rod, which represents priesthood. That's a, or the rod of Aaron. So you have the manna that he fed the, them in the wilderness for 40 years. Then you have the tablets that the Lord wrote on with Moses, representing his word or his law. The manna was revelation. And then there was the rod where it's priesthood, where you and I are called to be priest unto the Lord. But these are in the most holy place, which is the final chamber, isn't it? See, because... What happens now, I want you to look at the Ark of the Covenant is us now. Now we are the Ark. We are the temple. See, for you to go into the most holy place, you must be the temple. Because the temple dwells in the most holy place. Are you listening? That's why we must fulfill our priesthood. This is where new birth is. Why? Because this fulfills the third feast of first fruits, which we call resurrection this is new birth you are a new birth creation see this is the place where you're walking in a newborn again state of being aren't you where old things have passed away and all things are becoming new so we see that the first three feasts were fulfilled even when jesus died on the cross went to hell and then rose again right and then he fulfilled the feast of pentecost which is the promise, now listen, is the promise 
of the eternal kingdom within. So they've gone through, now if you look at this, if you've gone through the tabernacle, what are you going to? The eternal realm. But we're still here, aren't we? We haven't gone through that, all of that yet, have we? We're not, we're not through yet. So it's a representation, just like the, the vision that he showed me, that when we went through the final door, the final, we entered into the eternal. But see, even associated with the feast, what he did is he brought the promise that the eternal realm or the eternal kingdom would dwell in us on the Feast of Pentecost. So the eternal kingdom came within. That's called fulfillment of Pentecost. Is everybody okay? Now, trumpets, which is the next feast, was a warning, is a warning of the door shutting. It's the warning. With signs and God's wrath that comes because of the rejection of entering the door. So it's a warning that the door is going to be shutting. So he's giving everybody still opportunity. Why? Because he's trying to get everybody to come to repentance so they enter into the door. You know, almost like, sounds strange, like cattle, you know. <laughs> you know, when you, you got to open and shut doors for the, uh, the cattle to go through and whatever. Why? Because they're not listening. And hopefully they don't get branded before they get in. Because they won't get in if they're branded with 666. And there's the atonement, which is the rescue promise to Israel. It is the rescue promise to Israel. Because God will not let Israel be left behind. Is everybody understanding? It's the ending of the fight, the day of atonement. It is the promised rescue of Israel so that they will not be left behind because there is promised land and people. And then there is the Feast of Tabernacle, which is the, now listen, this is the Feast of Tabernacle. This is where it is the eternal on the earth. The eternal on the earth for what? 1,000 years. So the eternal will be on the earth for 1,000 years. Now turn to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Are you getting the vision here? I, I, I've got one more vision to share with you also. Revelation 21, the first three verses. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, this is where the earth and the heaven, which is all burned up, right? You see a new earth and a new heaven. This is where the new earth and the new heaven are in the eternal. Why? Because the heaven of this realm is now moved. The heaven of this realm of this universe. Now, when I saw, the, and the Lord began to share, show me this um, area of the universe, and I began to see the universe floating out in eternity now. I mean, this whole vast universe floating in eternity. And then all of a sudden, when he shared with me that I'm going to remove all of this too, it like got sucked up through a hole. <laughs> I mean, just like, whew, and it was just gone. And then I saw... Uh, like a, a new a new uh, earth and um, a whole different heaven that I can't even, I, I don't even understand. But that's all I, that's, this is when he said to me, the new earth and the new heaven are now in the eternal. Because prior to that, it was in this realm. Now everything is brought into the eternal. In other words, we've gone through the tabernacle now. And we've gone through that last door in the tabernacle, the last chamber in the tabernacle, and we've gone through, and everything was made new. And everything that was is gone, all gone, all gone. No more clothing shops, no more seas, no more stars in the skies. The whole universe was gone. And that's all I can tell you, because I didn't see any more after that. <laughs> the only thing I, he kept sharing with me Oh, go to John 3, and we'll close here. And I saw the universe floating, and then the eternal swallowed it up. <laughs> and John 3, 3. 
And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? No, but we can enter into the eternal womb. And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he says, see, then he says, enter. That is why we must be what? Born again. To see the kingdom because of being in the outer darkness. Can't see it, can you? Nor enter because of not going through the tabernacle of Jesus. So you can't see it by being in the outer darkness. And you can't enter it without going through the tabernacle of Jesus. That's why you must be born again to enter this eternal realm. And I can only share with you again the essence of visualization he wants us to begin to see more because the visualization will begin to expand you in the area to receive more that he has. It will not only increase your faith, but your purpose. Are you hearing? Because when you begin to see these things and God begins to show you these things, your life in this realm begins to get severed more, more. And more, all of the cares, all the worries, all the frustrations, all of this other garbage that's involved in this realm, you'll be able to sever more and more. Why? Because you know that this purpose awaits you. We must go through the tabernacle. Everyone only can go through Christ Jesus, the true tabernacle, the entrance port of the eternal. Is everybody okay? That's why we must constantly, no matter where you are, remember this door is shutting. It's only going to be open for 3,000 years. And then it's shutting. And that's that. What an honor. Do you know what an honor it is to be alive? Do you know what an honor it is, unfortunately, to be a humanite? But praise God, now you're born again. So you're no longer human. You're eternal. See, now that the, the eternal kingdom dwells in you by his spirit, you have dominion over everything of this natural realm. You're just waiting to hang up the flesh and go through the port and go home. <laughs> See, but that's why he says you must conduct yourself in the proper way. Just as priests come out from among them and be separate. Don't touch anything unclean and I'll be your father and you'll be my children. The, the path is narrow and difficult, but great is the reward. <laughs> Time's running out and the door is going to be shutting and we want to get as many people through that door because there won't be any more. Why God chose us, who knows, but he did. The Bible says he chose us, we didn't choose him. But now we choose him because he first chose us. But this is it. All the, every human, every person that's come into this realm has an opportunity to live in the eternal forever. And everyone that reaches, there won't be any more. This is it. As far as we know, this is it. All of this, all of this in a 7,000 year period to enter eternal realm. Universe, earth, sun, planets, fishies, birdies, and everything else. All of this created just <laughs> for us. In him, through him, for him. That he would have a people to share the eternal with. I mean, can we comprehend that? You know, when you begin to share all these things with me, I was like, yeah. how do you write this stuff down, you know? I mean, that's all I could do is visualize it and ask for the best to express it. The door's shutting soon. That's why he says that judgment is in the house of God to slap his kids and get them right. Quit playing games out there. Don't reject the invitation. And conduct ourselves correctly to maintain in the most holy place. Time is running out. Let's start rescuing more. Let's start evangelizing more. Don't be so concerned about yourself. What about the others? Wherever you go, more. You know, we want more. We want my, God's presence and whatever, but what do we do with it? It's time for more souls to get them through that port. Because once that door shut, it's over with. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We are honored and blessed for the revelation. I ask that you give each and every one in this room visualization with understanding. 
that they may comprehend and put this into their spirit. Let it be engraved in their spirit, Lord, that they will stand with boldness in fear and reverence unto you, but a reverence in the area where they fear that no one be left behind. No one. I pray a blessing over each and every one, Lord, and I ask that you continue to visit us in dreams and visions. Have mercy upon us, Master, and forgive us for every area where we have walked away from an opportunity to lead someone through the door. But grant us another opportunity and bring more. Bring more opportunities, Lord. Bring more. Draw them unto you that many more souls would be saved and you'd grant each and every one in here a huge harvest. In Jesus' name. Anybody said amen? Hallelujah.